Hey CBJ fans, welcome to Boom and Gloom, where we talk about the boom, the good, and the gloom, the bad, of Columbus Blue Jackets hockey. I'm Anthony, you might know me as Whaler Jacket in social media circles, and I call myself Ohio's longest suffering hockey fan. And, of course, I love talking about Columbus Blue Jackets hockey. If you happen to tune in last week, I told listeners that I would be trying something out. Um, I would be using my dad's 1950s straight-bladed wooden hockey stick at my beer league game. Well, I did. And if you are interested in seeing the results, you can find my channel on YouTube and check it out. It was a lot of fun, very difficult though, and it just, I I just can't believe that players back in the day used these type of sticks. It was very interesting to try out. Now, I only use it for warm-ups because I did not want to risk breaking it. Um, It was, it seemed almost uh, brittle or flat, uh, fragile, so I didn't, I didn't want a chance actually playing it with playing with it in the game, which was my uh, original plan. Anyway, if you are a new listener tuning into the podcast for the first time, thank you. I appreciate you giving this podcast a shot, and I I hope you enjoy it. Now, I I try to vary vary things up on the show. Sometimes I will do solo episodes where I just rant and rave about the jackets, and other times I'll have guests and we'll just talk about everything Blue Jackets. Now, I did have some guests lined up for today, but um, they they fell through, so it's just me today. But I just want to uh, let all the listeners out there know that this is a fan-based podcast. I am not an expert, and the guests I do bring on the show when I have them, they're not experts either. We're just hockey fans. We're just fans of the Blue Jackets, and we enjoy talking about the team. So if you enjoy hearing discussions and or rants and raves about the Columbus Blue Jackets, I hope you stick around and give this podcast a chance. So let's get started. This episode is all about the trade deadline. The moves that were made, the moves that were not made, and how this deadline impacts the Columbus Blue Jackets. So first to recap the Jackets' deadline moves, they brought in goaltender Malcolm Subban, and they assigned him to Cleveland. They shipped out Andrew Peake to Boston for a third-round draft pick and a player I've never heard of, uh, Jacob Zabaril. I think think that's what his name is, Jacob Zabaril. And they assigned him to Cleveland. And then they traded Jack Roslovic to the New York Rangers for a conditional fourth-round pick. And that was it. Those were the deadline deals. So first off, I'm going to play teacher here. I want to give a letter grade for the day. If I had to give John Davidson a grade on his 2024 trade deadline performance, I would give the man a B. He did an above average job. I think he he did a great job, okay? Um, I wanted the Jackets to clear out some of the roster log jams. I wanted them to get some goaltender depth for Cleveland. And I wanted them to clear some cap space for the new GM to work with. And he did all that. But I guess I'm, I'm just a tough grader, I guess, because I just can't give him an A. One thing that would have tipped the scales for me to give give him an A on this would be if he managed to trade Provorov or Bean. I wish they found a taker for one of those two. Now, since the moment Provorov arrived in Columbus, I have viewed him as nothing more than a stopgap defenseman for when uh, Denton Matejchuk is ready. Bean, he's a restricted free agent, and I'm not sure if he's going to be resigned. But considering how the season has gone, I really think they should have tried to trade one of them 
opened up a roster spot on defense and brought up guys like Juracek, uh, Svozel, and I, by the way, I still don't know if I'm saying his name right, Svozel, uh, Christensen, um, yeah, play, players in Cleveland on defense, just to see what they could do for the team. It's a lost season, so might as well give them give them some experience with the big club. But obviously it's tough to do that when there's no room on your roster. And I don't know, maybe the Jackets did try to do that. Maybe they tried to trade one of them and just couldn't find a taker. I doubt we'll know the answer to that for at least a while. Maybe never. Who knows? So, next season, where do I see Matejuk? Um I see him... I see him in Cleveland next year. You know, I mean, I guess there's a chance that he makes the big club, but uh, considering the time they're allowing Juracek to simmer in the AHL, I think Matejczyk goes to Cleveland. So what does our defense look like then, okay? All right, so next year, as of now, as of this moment, we have Wierenski, Bokvist, Severson, Goodbranson, Provorov, and Bean. That's six defensemen. If Juracek is going to be a full-time NHL NHL or next season, one of those six has to come out. And I think Provorov and Bean are still your candidates. Possibly possibly Adam Boquist, okay? But but Boquist has actually earned more of my trust. I, I was down on him earlier this season, but but he's come a long way. So my vote would be Provorov, Provorov or Bean. And I think the new GM comes in, and I think he does trade at least one of those two. So then Juracek comes in, and then you have Svotzel, you have Blankenberg, okay? You have Christensen, maybe even Matejchuk, maybe someone else. But then that, that person serves as the seventh D-man, okay? But I, I think there's also a chance that the new, G, that the new GM trades both Bean and Provorov. Or, or even Bofit, Bokefist, bringing him back into this. If it brings back more stay-at-home defensemen. At this point, I just think we have too many offensive-minded defensemen right now. And that's one thing that the new GM will try to fix very soon into his or her tenure. Now, before we go on to some forward analysis, how about that Alex Nylander, huh? Makes me wonder, is this a flash in the pan? Or is this guy reaping the benefits of a change of scenery and unlocking the talent that made him a top 10 pick? I mean, he's been a solid addition to the Blue Jackets lineup. He had a hat trick the other day. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm just, I don't know the exact number here. I'm just going to kind of guess here. But I think he has like seven points in nine games or something like that. So whether he stays next season will be up to the new GM. And if he can sustain some reasonable success, like the success that he's been having so far the rest of the season, maybe he'll he'll be on the team next year. Myself, though, I have to be honest, I think we're looking at a flash in the pan. Now, I hope I'm wrong, but the Jackets really haven't had that kind of luck, have they? We've seen... Plenty of players move out and have success elsewhere. But as for taking a chance on a dude and having it pay out or pay off, I should say, beyond our expectations, that just doesn't happen to the Jackets. I can remember it happening once. Sam Gagne. Okay, nobody expected him to flourish here, and he did. And there there have probably been others, but I just I can't think of any right now. But... You know, the the usual would be that Alex Nylander has come in. He's put up some good numbers early, but that'll fade in time. All right, so I wanted to uh, take a look at some of the... Take a look at the forward situation that the Blue Jackets have going on and see and talk about how it relates to next year. All right, currently we have three guys out of the lineup. 
Okay, we have uh, Line A, Fantilli, and Johnson. We have several restricted free agents that that will still need to be re-signed if the GM wants to re-sign them. So what will the GM do here? Who are the locks to remain on the roster? Meaning, who will definitely be here next year? Well, you know, when we have a new GM, who will still definitely be here? So here are my locks. Here, these players, in my opinion, are not going anywhere. If they need a contract, they will be re-signed. Um, if they're injured, they'll be back. Here are my locks. Gaudreau, Fantilli, Chinikov, Voronkov, Marchenko, Sillinger, Jenner, and Corrali. That's eight players, okay? Gaudreau, Fantilli, Chinikov, Voronkov, Marchenko, Sillinger, Jenner, and Corrali. Okay? So, of those I've, I listed, I think most most fans would probably agree with me that they're locks. Maybe not Corrali, but I feel that Corrali needs to be here because he is a veteran and he knows what it takes to win. He's been on uh, winning teams. He came from the Boston Bruins. So I think he needs to stay. So let me list the players that I considered not locked. Line A, Johnson, Texier, Danforth, and the previously mentioned Nylander. So, let me start with Johnson, okay? I, I want to keep Johnson. I really do. But I'm just saying that I don't think he's a lock, okay? I, I could see a new GM wanting a different style of player to add to the lineup, and Johnson would be a heck of a bargaining chip, I think. So if there was somebody the new GM really wanted to, to bring in to alter the makeup of this roster, John can, Johnson can do that. I mean, he he has that that uh, potential, all right? He, he's known as a uh, big-time prospect. And again, don't, don't hear me wrong on this, okay? I like Johnson. I want the Jackets to keep him. But the fact is, if a new GM is going to come in and make changes, I think we need to... Uh, as Blue Jackets fans understand that there are going to be some changes that we may not like. We may, seem, we may see some players go that we don't want to see go. But I think that's part of trusting the new general manager. Patrick Laine. Uh Kind of the same thing. All right? I mean, I've, I've never been a huge Laine fan. I've kind of always viewed him as a one-trick pony. Um a one-trick pony who has not produced since he's been on the Jackets. But, oh, again, he's been injured. So it's tough to make an accurate assessment of, of how he's done. So I could see him being a bargaining chip. He has the big name, he has the talent, and he has the, the resume of putting up a lot of goals. So there may be another team out there that thinks, oh, okay, well, he didn't work out in Columbus, but I think he'll work out here. So if that happens, again, that's a huge bargaining chip that will that would allow uh, the new GM to not only clear up some cap space, but to bring in uh, some high-end talent to replace him. Um, the other three I mentioned, Texier, Danforth, and Nylander. Um, okay, again, don't get me wrong, Texier, I like the guy. He's a solid player, but again, I think something has to give. If the new GM is going to want to bring in some of his choices, something has to give. Give some Somebody has to move out. So I've explained who my locks were that I think a new GM would want to keep no matter what. I don't think Texier falls into that category of, man, I got to keep this guy no matter what. I've already talked about Nylander, so the last person I'll talk about is Justin Danforth. And it kind of hurts because... If I if I had to pick a favorite player on the Blue Jackets, that's who I, that's who who I would have said, Justin Danforth. Um, I've always been kind of partial to the undersized, uh, big heart, big effort players. They may not put up a lot of points, but they always give 110 percent game in and game out, and that's Justin Danforth. 
Now myself growing up playing hockey, um, I was a, a shorter guy. I'm five foot seven. So in high school, I was the, the guy who would get his butt kicked in the corners, but I would always give my best effort. So I kind of relate to players like Dan Forth. And we need players like that on the team. But again, if we're looking at the need to alter our roster in a way to change this to a winning culture, there has to be some changes and some players have to be moved out. And so I think Dan Forth is one of those candidates. So there you have it. Those are my my picks, my locks and unlocks, I guess you'd say, for next year. Uh, right now, obviously, it's all speculation because we have a new general manager coming in. Uh, it's going to be a whole bunch of changes, but uh, that's what I'm thinking right now. All right, I want to move on to another topic here, and that is uh, the size of the size of the Blue Jackets forwards. I was thinking about this the other day, and I wanted to to bring it up on a podcast. Uh, so if you listeners want to weigh in, you can. So so here's here's what I noticed about our roster, okay? Right now, we have some smallish players playing for the Blue Jackets. We have Johnny Gaudreau, who stands 5'9". We have Justin Danforth, who is 5'8". Trey Fix... Lo- Fix lo- I cannot say his name. Fix Wolanski. He's 5'7". And then... Um, Johnson's injured, but uh, he's six feet, but he's, he's a small six feet. All right. He's kind of a a thinner guy. And then look at some of the up and comers. James Malatesta. He's five, nine. Jordan Dumay, who a lot of people are excited about is five, eight. Gavin Brindley, who's, who a lot of people are also excited about. He's five, nine. And even if we look a little further down the line, Luca Pinelli, another prospect, he's also 5'9". We have some small forwards with some small prospects looking to make the big club in the next few years. So that is a reason why I think the GM will look to find a taker for Justin Danforth. And I, I personally think there'll be some options because Danforth is a player, and I think a lot of teams will want what he brings to the table. And going back to what I said about Johnson, I think the new GM will, might think about moving him. Because a lot of these players are small, and that kind of, sort of worries me. Now, I've been told that Gavin Brindley plays well above his size. I get that. I've heard James Malatesta plays well above his size. I get that. But you know, this this is a league with some big players in it. And if the new GM comes in and thinks, you know, I want a bigger team, then we're going to see some of these smaller players moved out. So again, that goes back to what I said that as Jackets fans, I think we're going to, we're going to see some changes that we just don't like, and we just have to accept that. We'll just have to trust that it's the new general manager's plan. So with all that in mind, I can see us losing someone like Johnson or, you know, one of the smaller players, or, or Texier. And then as for Line A, going back to him, we'll just have to see how that plays out. Assuming he comes back next season and he comes back healthy, I think there's a chance he's moved for some key pieces. I think someone will want him in that big, tro- that big contract that he carries, especially with that salary cap going up next year. Some other questions that I've been pondering here. Um... Will Elvis be on the roster next season? Now, there were some who hoped that he would be moved at the trade deadline, and I guess I hoped that a little bit. I just, I was more of a, a realist, and I didn't think that was even a slight possibility. So I didn't really hope for it because I knew it wasn't going to happen. But will he be on the roster next year? I'm going to have to give you a big fat, I don't know. I I just don't. I just, I think it's too hard to predict, you know, not knowing who the new GM will be and and how he or she will feel about our goaltending situation. Another question is, will Pascal Vincent be the head coach? Now that I will give a prediction for. I think he's gone. I think the new GM will want to bring in his or her own personal choice. 
Larson will be off the books, so ownership will most likely be okay with paying the remainder of Vincent's one-year contract. But the bottom line is that I don't think Vincent has done enough good to remain in the favor of a new GM. Now, I rip on the guy a lot, I admit it. You know, I think he makes a lot of bonehead decisions. I think he could have done a, a much better job motivating and doing actual coaching to prevent some of the losses this season that you know where we gave up substantial leads in the third period. I disagreed with some of his benching tactics and his distribution of ice time. But he he's done some good too. And he was thrown into a tough situation after the Mike Babcock debacle. I mean, that's, that's a fact. He got thrown into that. But I think it hasn't been enough. Okay, the new GM will want new blood to go along with a new vision. And Vincent just hasn't impressed enough to make that new GM say, you know what, I'm going to give him another shot. I'm going to give him another year to see what he can do. I don't think so. I think the new GM's going to want to hit the ground running and get a new person on the bench with a new perspective. So that's it. That's my uh, trade deadline recap and my look towards the future. Um, that'll do it. That'll do it for this week's episode. And I hope if you're listening to this, you will join me again for the next episode of Boom and Gloom. I would love to say that we'll be talking about the up the upcoming playoffs, but you know we're we're Jackets fans, so no playoff talk for us again. But there will be some topics to talk about, especially the GM search, and hopefully we'll get to see some prospects get a shot with the big club. You know, maybe just for a game or two as we get closer to the end of the season. Hopefully, we'll see Fantilli back in the lineup. You know, we're 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 often told that the future is bright for the Columbus Blue Jackets. So hopefully we will finally see the beginnings of that bright future as we continue to progress through the season and as they close it out. So Jackets fans, thank you for joining me. Farewell and go Jackets.